please welcome the CEO of AirAsia.com, Karen Chan, in conversation with Skiff founding editor and executive editor, Dennis Shaw. Hey, Karen, thanks for being here. Really great having you here. We had a fun and very lively conversation leading up to this interview, and I know you're fired up about AirAsia.com, so, so let's do this. Thank you, Dennis, uh, for having me. Sure. So um, just for context, I was shocked in August when AirAsia announced uh, during its second quarter earning results that it had successfully pivoted into a digital lifestyle company uh, <laughs> grounded in travel. And I, I jokingly said, you know, just like that. Well, of course, it's been, you know, a couple of year journey so far, but critics would say, you know, easier said than done. So, um, but before we get deeper into that, tell me what's been going on over the last couple of weeks. You relaunched the app, you rebranded the website, done some other things. So can you update us on that first? Sure, no problem. Uh, absolutely, Dennis. I think, you know, when um, we started announcing to the world that we're going to become from an ASEAN budget carrier, right? Whereby we are actually known as great looking, cruel and really good pilots to becoming an ASEAN super app, there were skeptics. And I'm sure Tony would have said the same thing. 19 years ago, when he started with two planes and they, he bought out the airline at one ringgit, there were the same people who were also skeptical and look at where we are now. And I guess a lot of the reason why we are very confident in becoming a super app is because we have actually been doing it for the past 19 years. We are one of the first carrier to start selling flights online. So in terms of the tech stack, it's actually pretty much there. What we are actually doing, and as a result of COVID, we have actually been accelerating the unification of multiple platforms into one, which is AirAsia.com, so that now we can actually go faster, not just selling flights alone, but also looking at hotels, activities, which is actually within the travel vertical. But we have also now moved into the e-commerce vertical and the financial services. And what we have actually done in the past few weeks is absolutely the testimony of our pivot from basically selling flights. I think anybody who knows about AirAsia, they will know about our big sale. Every quarter, we'll go and do crazy 1 million free seats, right? And then people will come to our site and we'll get about 120,000 users every second coming to our site. We decided to go and change it from just talking about big sale for flights. We have now pivoted to super app, super sale. Everything, the 17 line of business that's actually on airasia.com, you can now actually go and have, have a look go inside airasia.com. Some of them are up to 90% sale. We sold um, some of our duty-free products um, at 90% off, got sold out in five minutes on day one. And so what we've been trying to do is to start educating and going into the market to go and tell customers that not only can you buy flight or travel related, you can now go and buy potatoes and zucchini. We actually tracked 2000 orders in the first day for our fresh portal. You can now also get home delivery of your duty free. Even though you're not traveling, right? Women, they still love shopping. Online shopping is not going to go away just because they can't fly. So now we deliver duty free to your home. And that's where you are actually seeing a lot of the growth. Great. So the premise of this is, you know, people come to airasia.com to shop for flights. They're looking for flight deals, right? And value conscious. Uh, consumers are notoriously fickle. They'll go somewhere else if they find a better price. And your whole premise is you're going to convert them from shopping for discount flights to buying scarves or opening a bank account with big pay, um, buying zucchini, getting food delivery. Um, how do you change consumer behavior like that? It, it's it's really not easy. I mean, other travel companies have tried to do that. I think of TripAdvisor. They they were known as a hotel review site, and they pivoted to be a hotel booking site. They did a massive app, not massive. They did an advertising campaign, and it really wasn't successful. So, what gives you confidence that that you can make this change? If I can actually just quote from my personal trainer, Dennis. Every time I have to go and do chin ups. He will say, hey, Karen, every winner starts as a beginner. And I guess we are actually on this journey. But there's quite a few things, three things that's actually an advantage that AirAsia.com has. The first is 
the path to profitability for AirAsia.com is slightly different. Because we already are sitting on 75 million customer database, our job right now is not to acquire new customers. Our job is about converting. We already have a very high average ARPU, average revenue per user, as compared to maybe some other super app, because they have been so used to purchasing tickets. So when you actually are used to purchasing 300, 600 ringgit, for you to go and start adding to your basket 10 ringgit, 15 ringgit for fresh, the barrier for entry is much less than when you are actually selling, you know, ride hailing, and then you need to go and sell a flight ticket. So it's actually quite reverse. We are going from top all the way down, lower to the funnel. So I think that's a first point. The second point that we have is that I think consumer behavior can actually be shaped by value proposition, by channel, and also by the data so that we can be very, very targeted in the personalized upsell offers that we can provide for our consumers. So let me give you an example. When I talk about value proposition, so everybody will say, Karen, why do you think you can actually go and beat, you know, some of the bigger OTAs, right? Everybody has done flight and ticket bundle. Uh, flight and hotel bundle. Why do you think you will succeed? And I'll always joke to say that we are the only OTA that has metal. We actually own an airline. Right now, it might be a bit of a liability, but the fact is that we actually control the price lever. So I give you a very simple example. Pre-COVID, we fly to Singapore 13 times a day. The morning and the evening flights are never full. But that means that because we actually control the revenue, we know our yield curve 365 days out. And because I know that for the morning and the evening flight, we only have 85% load factor, that means I still have 23 to 25 seats unsold in my morning and my evening flight. I can now go and sell it at one ringgit, about 25 cents US. And now I'm bundling with my direct source hotel so that I can go into the market with best price guarantee unbeatable. And that's exactly what we have done. And we've actually seen the success. So what we have actually done now is that every Wednesday, we call it crazy snap day. So we call it snap, right? As easy as three clicks, you can actually go and buy both your flight and your hotel. We will always select one of our strategic hotel partner and only promote that hotel in that particular destination. So three, four weeks ago, before we have another lockdown in Malaysia, which just started this week, we sold a Langkawi five-star hotel, 2,000 room nights in four hours. That hotel was blown away because they have never seen that sort of traffic and that sort of volume and conversion. And that's what we are very, very confident with. And that's the first part, the value proposition. The second is about channel. I mean, if you look at what live streaming sale has now become, whether it's on Tmall, whether it's on TikTok, it has now become the, the biggest selling proposition using live streaming. And if you really start thinking about this, it was, it's basically a reiteration, a rebirth of TV shopping, right? You better buy now because we only have five more of this particular product. It's exactly that. And so this week, when we were launching our super app, Super Sale, we did exactly that. We did a, basically a live streaming show across all our different products duty-free on, on the Tuesday, second day, 40% of our revenue was actually driven by the 10 minutes that we were actually on the channel talking about a particular, you know, like um, cosmetic <clears throat> product in Korea. So that's why I feel that when the price is right, when you are actually matching how consumers are now shopping and matching where they are actually looking for deals, looking for products, I think they, it, this will actually work for us. So um, you mentioned hotels. Mm. So booking.com has 2.6 million properties uh, on its website. It took them about 15 years to build up that inventory. Do you have the resources to go out, you know, and directly contracting with, with hotels, you know, hundreds of thousands of hotels? And what kind of marketing can spend do you have to compete with? Booking.com and Agoda and Expedia, they spend, you know, some of them spend, you know, three, four billion dollars a year on marketing. How are you going to compete? 
allow me to answer your question in two parts. First is basically the sourcing and also the volume of infantry that we need, and then about our go-to-market strategy. So on the first piece, I, I think, you know, like Tony would also have shared with you, right? In these times, we are not trying to compete. We need to collaborate. So Tony always encouraged, Karen, go and sleep with everybody. You need to be friends, right? Frenemies in man many ways. And I think if you've actually seen some of the announcement that's been coming out, we have already announced strategic partnership with CTRIP. We've also announced strategic partnership with Agoda. The reason being is that we need to go and have a barbell strategy in terms of how we acquire infantry for hotels. We will not be looking at 200,000, 300,000 properties. We are already covering close to 300 different destinations within ASEAN. I just want to go for the top 50 in every single destination. Because to be fair, right, if you actually go and study consumer behavior, how many people would go to page 10 on any of the OTA site to look for a hotel? By page three, you are done. So in many ways, what we need to go and focus on is where are we actually serving? If you look at our network, we actually have 25% of routes that is monopolistic. Only Air Asia flies there, which means that you need to go to those places only with us. So let's go and focus on making sure that we can direct source from those destinations whereby we are monopolistic mm. and we get the best margin. At the same so, time, I'm sorry, go ahead. At the same time, we are also working with most of the aggregator. I strongly believe in sharing inventory for scalability across ASEAN. There's no way we can actually go and talk to every single hotelier. The good thing about COVID is that before COVID, a lot of the four and five star hotel doesn't want to work with us, right? Who are we? We are a budget carrier. Now we have signed up with close to 500 properties directly, including some of the major chain, Shangri-La. We are already in discussion with Hyatt. We've actually signed up with Bajaya, Sunway. So there's a lot of different ASEAN-specific group, Anatara as well, that we've already signed up with so that re really we can go and reignite tourism together within ASEAN. So speaking of frenemy, frenemies, you had a long-standing joint venture with Expedia. And I yeah. spoke to um, Tony earlier this week, and he told me, well, we learned a lot about from that joint venture. We decided we could do it ourselves. So that, that joint venture ended. Um, I, guess you, I guess you still have a relationship with Expedia. Um, but what kind of lessons did you take from that joint venture? Okay, so, so maybe if I can just clarify. So agree, we have actually um, sunsetted a shared domain called Air Asia Go, which were mainly selling hotels, air trans airport transfers and flights, airasia.com flights. And now we basically move all the infantry back onto airasia.com. That was a premise for why we would like to go and have everything within one ecosystem in terms of separate domain. So in terms of the exclusive partnership that has ended, but actually we are still working pretty closely with Expedia in terms of leveraging on the infantry for hotels. And we are still working very closely with them in terms of the flight ticketing business. I think we have learned quite a lot from them. So the first thing is basically speak to market. When we are new in a particular industry, you need to go and work with specific and you know much larger um, partners to ensure that you can actually have the right infantry and the right scalability when you want to go and penetrate into new markets. Expedia allow us to do that in quite a few North Asian markets. The second piece is about Margins is no, I, I was just going to say, we, we, have a, we have an audience question, and it's kind of related yeah. to another point I wanted to make. So AirAsia.com and AirAsia, the metal, uh, operate independently, but AirAsia was only operating at about 45% of capacity in Malaysia in August. Uh, you shut down operations in Japan. You may be bowing out of India. So that has to impact what you're trying to do and a related audience question i think is they say you know the sales that you're running uh at 90 percent off they can't be su sustainable you know so on the one hand the airline is struggling on the other hand you're promoting these gigantic sales how does it all fit together so okay there's two questions here so the first piece is yes the reason why we have de decided to go and actually spin AirAsia Digital, of which AirAsia.com as a platform is one particular entity, is that we need to go and start decoupling, first of all, 
some of the, we need to go and start focusing on growth. If we look at the airline for the next maybe 12 months to 24 months, it would be about cost containment. It would be about rationalization. So how are we going to go and continue to grow? AirAsia.com as a platform is purely about growth. Now, are we going to be able to go and subsidize some of the losses that we are incurring? And, and let me just quickly share with you some of the data on the airline piece. Obviously, international borders are closed. For Malaysia Air Asia, we are now flying back to about 60-70% of domestic capacity versus last year. And we anticipate for Q4, we'll go back to 70-80%. to 80%. Thailand Air Asia, on the other hand, is close to 100% for the domestic capacity. And they're going very strong, especially when you also hear news is that, you know, some other, some other airlines are struggling. So we are grabbing market share. And over the last three months, we have been able to increase our market share by 3.2%. Indonesia, Philippines, Air Asia, they are at different stages. Look at the protests in Jakarta. So we already have a domestic operation. We are going to scale up for Q4. Philippines is doing the same with Palawan now being open. So domestic is going to be our focus for the airline. But at the same time, we also need to focus on growth. And that's where the platform play comes in. And again, let me re re reiterate, we are not spending 500 million US in getting new customers. We already have 75 million customer base across the entire group. Now what we have to focus on is to convert them, is to make sure that they can now come back with higher frequency, even if the basket size might be a bit smaller than the 300, 400 ringgit for purchasing a ticket, but we keep the stickiness to ensure that they can now come back and understand that we have a lot more to offer, whether it's a travel vertical or the e-commerce vertical. Now, on the other point, on 90%, it is the same for any e-commerce marketplace. The 9.9, the 10.10, the double 11. You will see some crazy skews that are being basically lost leaders. But what do you actually do? You attract the consumers to come in. Just then when I talk about 90% of selling a particular duty-free, we have only 150 sets. But guess what? We sold 650 other sets, maybe at 40% off, maybe at 35% off. Once you get the people come in and then they see sold out, everybody is FOMO, right? Fear of missing out. Once you get them on, it is up to us using the data that we have, the targeted predictive selling that we already have over all the different touch points that we have garnered for our consumer to be able to keep them there on the site and to convert them. That's where our strength is. It's basically our big data and our understanding of our consumer purchasing behavior. I just wanted to briefly say, you know, I've been covering online travel agencies for a long time, and I've heard a lot of talk about how we're going to use our data and our databases are connected seamlessly. Expedia was one that talked about that for years. They have the largest database of, of you know, of, of travel information. Uh, and then the CEO this year uh, admitted, well, this bucket didn't talk to that bucket. So in practice, it didn't really work out that way. Um, but one thing I wanted to say was um, one of the really interesting things you're doing is you're selling a bunch of other airlines on AirAsia.com, some through your partnership with Kiwi. Uh, I saw flights from United, Turkish, Qatar, El Al, Ethiopian, Emirates, and, and Qantas, among others. So how is that going to work? Do you, um, do you not sell their flights on routes, on overlapping routes with your own airline? What's the business relationship like with those carriers? Okay. I love the way you package so many questions. <laughs> so, well, I don't so have enough me, time with you. <laughs> so allow me to quickly answer on the piece of being brand and airline neutral. As a platform, we can't be precious about just Air Asia. That, that's not going to work. We have to be brand agnostic. And so starting last year, right, we've actually started, again, the same barbell strategy. We work in an aggregator, Kiwi.com, our strategic partner, to go and start selling other airlines. And believe it or not, even during lockdown, we are still tracking sales for people who actually want to go to Paris, who want to go to London that we do not cover. And they are buying it for 2021, June onwards. So there's a lot of future booking that's actually still happening. And the main reason why we wanted to do this is about virtual interlining and fly through. If you look at Air Asia as a budget carrier, we, have, we are the experts in point to point, right? From destination A to B.
However, if you are actually talking about alliances, we want to first start an experiment on virtual interlining, whereby a customer from Penang might have to fly to KL before they actually fly to London using maybe Emirates or any other um, airline. So that's what we are looking at. Basically, Air Asia DNA is about connectivity. Connecting people to destination, and more importantly now with the platform, is about connecting people to pay people with the communities and some of the chat functions that we are actually building in to drive velocity. But that's one of the premise. And when you mention some of the Middle Eastern airline, we are now talking about direct partnership with them. Very soon you'll be seeing some crazy, crazy deals again, working with Turkish airline. We are announcing our strategic partnership with Turkish very soon and some of the other Middle Eastern carriers. On your other question about data, you are absolutely right. Whilst Expedia have many buckets, AirAsia also have many buckets and silos. For the past six months, the first thing that I've tasked my tech team to do is to go and integrate. We need to go and unify platform and you need to go and unify our data lake so that it's not sitting in six disparate places. We need to basically have a single value chain on our consumer. That's the only way we can actually understand what is the purchasing cycle and the lifetime value of consumers. And we have been, and it's still work in progress. It will never be perfect, but we are already working on that. I'm going to bundle one last question, kind of like a holiday package. But um, you came from the you came from outside the industry, you know, uh, from outside the travel industry. What was it like coming into Air Asia from outside the travel industry? Uh, did did you say to yourself? Why are these people doing this? And how hard is it to change the culture? So I, I have been working in digital transformation across e-commerce, across fast food chains, doing omni-channel from basically online to offline for the past 10 years. So I guess every time when we talk about digital transformation, the first thing you change is not the CTO or the tech platform. The first thing you need to change is actually people's mindset. The only way you can actually go and convince an 18 year employee who can have only been selling flights and to convince them to go and sell other competitive flights is to let them taste blood. If you actually go and allow them to go and see the early wins, the low hanging fruit, you already get buy in, which is exactly what we have actually done when we start opening, you know, our platform to other, other airlines. We started doing crazy value proposition and they see, wow, Instead of basically this particular basket size, I can now get three times more because I'm now selling a flight to, to London. And hence, basically, my KPI is a lot easier to go and achieve. You go and convince them. And it's always about baby steps. One thing I learned about working for the airline industry, and I think, you know, leading during crisis is that, first of all, you have to survive on four hours sleep every day. <laughs> and, and the second thing is that you need to be very, very transparent. And it's okay to be vulnerable. This is the time to lead with courage. And one thing I really admire about Tony is that many, many organizations talk about learn fast, fail fast. But then if you fail, you are out. With Tony, it's like you're an idiot. Just go and pick up yourself and don't make the same mistake again. And that is really, really important. As you start pivoting for digital transformation, leadership team and the board has to endorse that. And that then has to be cascaded across the entire culture. I'm sure there will be more pivots along the way because th this isn't uh, a one or two year journey that you're on, but uh, it's super interesting and the whole world is watching. Thank you. Thank you.